From the studios of Channel 12, I Believe in Miracles, with a message of hope and music of inspiration, with your host, Pastor John Michael. And I'd like to introduce uh, my guest who is here, whose name is Williams Flores, and he is from uh, Lima, Peru. Cierto, mi nombre es William Flores, y hoy quiero presentarles a mi pastor en Lima, Perú. Es el varón que ha hecho unos cambios en mi vida. Eh, este varón, a la edad de 12 años lo conocí, y fui a su escuela cristiana, luego a los 15 años vine a la universidad, y simplemente ha sido una bendición para mi vida, y quiero que ustedes lo conozcan también. Well, Bill, what did he say? <laughs> what did he say? Can you enlighten me at all? Okay, Pastor. Well, what he said is that basically uh, he came to know me in Lima, Peru, and that through us he was able to become involved in a Bible preaching church and in a Christian school. And uh, through the direction then of the Christian school, he was able to uh, finish his education in English, learn English, and go on to Bible College in the United States, which he has, in fact, done. So when did he come to the United States, do you know? Well, he uh, f started in Peru in 1989, the end of 89-90 school year, and from the 89-90 school year, then he was only in the eighth grade. But because of the individu individualized curriculum that we had, it's a School of Tomorrow curriculum that we use there, and, uh, which was good for both languages, then he uh, actually did all eight years in one year to catch up with himself, uh, learning English as he went. And then the next year he did his ninth and his tenth grade year, and then after that he did his eleventh and twelfth grade year, graduating when he was fifteen years old. Uh, so he actually migrated <coughs> to the United States when he was 15. When he was 15 college. years old, he went to college, uh, Maranatha And you Baptist called your Bible school college. the Pioneer Christian School in Lima, Peru. Mm -hmm. Why did you call it Pioneer Christian School? We called it that because we discovered that our school was the first truly Christian school with Christian, born-again saved teachers and a totally Christian curriculum that the country had ever had. And since then, you uh, left the country, you turned it over to a national pastor, to a national school administrator, and um, decided that you were going <laughs> to go to France. Well, it wasn't our decision so much, I think, as the Lord's. The Lord called us to France. Totally different culture, totally different uh, uh, language, totally different set of uh, standards uh, of life. Uh, going from a developing nation to a developed nation, uh, many changes in that, uh, uh, great changes in the nature of the ministry, but so it was a real blessing. So let me just kind of put people, you've, you've been used to traveling around the world. You grew up in a Navy family, your father was an officer, you went to Annapolis, you had um, four deployments uh, to uh, Vietnam, uh, you uh, taught at the, at the academy at Annapolis, and then um, uh, you uh, felt this, uh, this desire to be involved in evangelism and spreading the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which has led you a lot of places, but most recently to Paris, France. Now, it was last, last uh, fall that Marilyn and I flew out of Minnesota and we came to De Gaulle Airport in, in um, of Paris, France, and met Bill. He met us with a happy face and we uh, got in his car and drove to the little town, I call it a little town, is that right? Of, of Maison Lafitte. Um, and uh, tell me, Maisons Lafitte, how do you say it in French? Well, Maison Lafitte, that's right. And it is a little town. It's got 23,000 people in city it. City of Horses. It's called the City of Horses because it's got uh, 900 horses or so in that city. And it's a suburb of Paris. Uh huh. And a very beautiful little city. And, and you started a congregation. That's right. We uh, started having Bible studies in our home, and that developed then into what is now a church. So you've been approximately there four years. Four and a half. Yeah, the people different in Paris than they are in Peru? Sure they are. They're <laughs> very different. Uh, one of the big differences is uh, noticed when you go on the bus. You take a bus in Lima, Peru, and everybody's talking so loud you can't even hear yourself think. Uh, whereas you get on the bus in Paris, France, and everyone's so quiet you can hear a pin drop. Uh, they're reading something, but they don't talk that much to each other. They're more reserved, uh, more formal in their character and their upbringing, not as open. Yeah, now let's talk about the church because the church is why you're there. And um, you, you have found um, s some people to gather together and um, 
you started meeting in a room or in a house, right? That's right. We started in the apartment of um, a lady called Madame Tual, it would be Mrs. Tual in our language, and her daughter was already a Christian, a saved woman, and, uh, and we got permission to start the Bible study in her apartment. So there was room for just a handful of us there, about five or six when we started. And then when we came, you had us meeting in a hotel. Well, we were in the hotel conference room then, uh, where you, s where when you were visiting with us, we were in the hotel conference room, uh, the Hotel Clima of France, and uh, there we can fit in about 50 people. We're averaging now about uh, uh, 40 people coming uh, on Sunday mornings to the services in that hotel room. We don't have room for that in our house. Okay, and your ultimate goal would be maybe to have a permanent place where you could meet. Right. We, uh, that's the nature of church planning. You start with a handful. You teach the Bible. You preach the Word of God. Folks come to know Christ as their personal Savior. They follow the Lord in believer's baptism. And then they go on. And as they grow in Christ, then eventually uh, the goal is to wind up buying, purchasing your own property, your own building, and that they can call, hey, this is ours. This is the house of the Lord Jesus Christ here in our city. Well, now, Bill, we are, I'm so pleased that I can introduce you not only as uh, a missionary pastor, but as the pastor at large of Grace Baptist Church, because we <laughs> have the honor of, of um, being um, associated with you and your wife in the projects that you have, and, and it's a delight to have you on the telecast today. It's our pleasure. You know, we did. We, we did. We, we should share this that while we were there, after we were there for a couple of days, we we got on a train and we went to London. And um, coming into London, why, of course, uh, this became kind of a week of, of rest and relaxation, the, the four of us together <laughs> in the inner city. We saw the landmark place here of London, and um, I got event. to do some, you know, riding the tube in London is a great excitement. We stayed in the inner city of London, and we visited some, lots of religious places. And to just give you an idea of maybe a few of these uh, historic places, we went to... Um, uh, in South London to where Charles Haddon Spurgeon was buried. That's right. Wow. It was uh, really an, uh, an emotional experience because his testimony lives on today. And Charles Haddon Spurgeon was an outstanding preacher. And uh, he is uh, remembered here in a great monument in this particular cemetery. We also went to his tabernacle, which is very active today, and listened to the congregation sing. Beyond that, we went to a place called Bun Hill, which is a burial ground. and. There we found the tomb in, in remembrance of John Bunyan. Look at that uh, pilgrim underneath there. He wrote Pilgrim's Progress. Uh, in prison, he was a nonconformist, and that's sort of where we get our, our heritage, our roots, and a nonconformist. And uh, here he is remembered uh, as uh, that great author of Pilgrim's Progress. And uh, then, of course, in the same cemetery, Bunhill, is where we saw Isaac Watts, a great hymn writer and many of the hymns in, 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 in hymn books today that have stood the test of time uh, were written by Isaac Watts. What a joy to be there, and we saw many other places. Well, Bill, uh, this is, uh, it wasn't all just enjoyment and sightseeing because uh, remember the day we went to Hyde Park? Boy, wasn't that Tell something? Tell the people what Hyde different. Park is all about for those who yeah. don't remember or don't know. Okay, in Hyde Park you have Preacher's Corner, and uh, there, anybody can preach uh, or teach or speak about anything that they want to, and it's really uh, a gathering place for anybody and everybody who wants to voice their opinion, give their, uh, their particular teaching to whoever happens to stop and wants to stop by, and so it's known for that. And uh, we had uh, an incredible time there and met some good people there, and there was also some rather interesting uh, other groups there. And, with, yeah, very interesting, <clears throat> all the way from Christian atheist to... Um, yeah, contradictions in terms, uh, <laughs> Christian atheist. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes, and many, many different Christian mm -hmm. groups that were there giving a witness That's or, right. as well as um, those who are other, from other religions of the world. But a place where it's free to do that. That's right. And uh, uh, this is a wonderful freedom. part That's of our heritage, for. you know, and uh, celebrating the, f the uh, advent of the 4th of July and the anniversary of our country and all that, or the birthday of our country, it's good to remember that we have great freedoms. Um, is there anything more you want to say about Williams? Because I want Williams to speak in English before we go any further. Anything more you want to yeah. say about uh, Williams Flores? Well, just that he's been a real blessing. He's a real uh, encouragement to all of us because he's so dedicated to 
the, the God of the Bible. He's dedicated to the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, and that's the most important thing that any human being can really uh, have in their lives and hearts. Have that's a faith. Have a about. faith that works and have a faith that um, prevails. Amen. So let's give us a, an English uh, testimony about some things about yourself. So now that you understand me, I'm going to give you a testimony. Basically, I was saved at the age of seven years old. I grew up in a Christian home. But then at that point, when I turned seven, my mom just basically came to me and told me, well, you know what, you're seven, and now you must know your Savior. And in that moment, she showed me that I have sinned against God. And because of that, there is a punishment, there is a penalty, and that's we know the Word of God tells us hell. And in that moment, I just trusted Jesus Christ, my Savior, as my only hope to go to heaven. And since then, just I, start, I kept on coming to church, just being more involved in the work of God, and got baptized, and, and going to Christian school, and now just God has just blessed my life going to Christian college and serving the Lord full time in the ministry. That is great. That is great. And uh, you have plans for the future? Yes, sir. My plans is, are to go back to Peru and start uh, church first, and then a first Christian university in all the nation of Peru in Spanish, in Lima, Peru. Well, that's a grand goal. Yes, sir. God bless you. God Amen. bless you. As you continue your education here yes, and your sir. experience here in the States, mm -hmm. and then as you go back. Well, Bill, I want you to take that Bible you have in your hand. and. Um, Bill and I have our Bibles. We'll listen, okay, and give us a mm -hmm. message, a message of a, a pastor who has a world in his heart and has various, um, has that experience in various countries of the world. Well, you know, Pastor John, there's really only one message in the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, and uh, I believe that no one could speak a better message than what's given right here in the book of Revelation. So, in the last book of the Bible, uh, and chapter 1 and verse 1, we read these words, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him, to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bore record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Now the name Jesus, the revelation of Jesus Christ, those words, those first five words in verse 1 of chapter 1 really have a double sense. And this is what the whole Bible is about. From Genesis right through Revelation, the Bible teaches about salvation and redemption and the effort of God through the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God in the flesh, uh, to reach out and draw man back to himself, to reestablish the original relationship and creation that God had with him. Now, it's interesting that they use this term, the revelation of Jesus Christ, because there's a double sense. The first sense is explained in the first verse. It says, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. So the revelation reveals the future. No one knows the future except God. And God reveals the future of what's going to be happening in the book of Revelation. In French and in Spanish, this book is called the book of Apocalypse. And so we know it today as a book of judgments. And there's many books out today, and there's even been some films about that. But the fact is, is that just the way it's written in the book of Revelation is what is going to happen in the future. And people need to be ready for that because this world does not have a whole lot of justice in it. And God is going to bring justice back to the world. So it is a warning to those who would be unjust, to those who would abuse the privilege of the freedoms that they might have as a human being or think that God doesn't exist because they don't see too much justice. But there's another sense to this word revelation, and that is that it is the revelation of the person of Jesus Christ himself. And that is the subject of the whole first chapter. Who Jesus Christ is is very important. If someone says, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, today, 2,000 years after the event, today, after 2,000 years of history since the... Uh, life of Jesus Christ on earth, his death, burial, and resurrection, then uh, the name Jesus Christ can mean different things to different people. Some people, for example, when they think of Jesus Christ, they'll have instantly an image of Jesus Christ as a little baby in a manger somewhere around Christmas time. We bring that out, and we see that. Uh, then again, there is a side, uh, we think of Jesus as maybe a humble carpenter. And that's not bad because we should all be humble and not be afraid to work with our hands. And, uh, and it's, it's not a bad image considering who it was that was doing that. But here, in this first chapter, we have the real Jesus, as it were. We have the Jesus Christ of all eternity now revealing himself again to 
uh, one of his apostles, the Apostle John, and, uh, and, and listen to what John himself describes uh, this one uh, with whom he had walked and lived and eaten uh, for three and a half years. Uh, in verse 9 it says, I, John, who also am your brother, well, I like that. He just introduces himself so simply. He says, hey, I'm just your brother. If you're a believer in Christ, I'm just one of your brothers. Uh, he doesn't have, you know, he's not the big pope. He's not a big, the most right reverend anybody. He's not big on titles. He says, I, John, I'm your, I'm your brother. And uh, companion in tribulation, he knew what it was to suffer for the cause of Christ. And then in verse 10, it says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, that's not a bad place to be every day. But on the Lord's day, which is Sunday, he was actually in very close communion with God. And this is what happens. He says, I heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, write in a book, and send unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, and unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. And I turned to see the voice that spake with me, and being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks, and in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters." And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Now think about that a minute. This is Jesus Christ in undiminished glory. This is the real Christ. This is the one when Christians actually pray today. This is the one they're praying to. This is the one that was with Adam and Eve in the garden. This is Jesus in undiminished glory after the resurrection. It is even a greater glory than what he had on the Mount of Transfiguration. And it is such that when John saw him, he fell prostrate at his feet as dead. And I think anyone would when they saw that. Uh, what an incredible scene. Uh, but it's interesting because this is the same John that walked with Jesus Christ. This is the same John that did miracles with Jesus Christ. This is the same John that ate with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the same John that taught and, and, and listened at the feet of Jesus Christ and even rested his head uh, on the chest of Jesus Christ. The scriptures tell us that. They were very close. They were friends. And now Jesus, the same Jesus, is revealing himself as he really is. And I think today Christians need to understand who Jesus Christ really is. I think non-Christians, in order to be fair to someone who's never accepted Christ as their own Savior, they need to know who Jesus really is. Because today Christianity has become more or less of a preference among many religions. And then there are those that call themselves Christians that have no concept of what the Bible actually teaches about Christianity and how to be saved and how to know you're on your way to heaven and what redemption is all about. Here John the Apostle falls as dead, and then something very tender and beautiful happens. It says, And he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore, amen, and have the keys of hell and death. What a tender scene. What an amazing thing. Here, John, prostrate before the glory of the eternal God made flesh, Jesus, with whom he walked on the earth, now in undiminished glory, and he is on his face, because this is reality now. This is, in French, the, the Bible word for Lord is l'éternel, which means the eternal one. So this is God in the flesh. This is the eternal one. This is the one who has always existed. This is the one who created the heavens and the earth with his own word. Okay? There's no evolution here, folks. This is the word of the creator. His name is Jesus Christ. And John is on his face. And yet this same Jesus, this same eternal God, bends over and touches John and says, Hey, it's okay, John. It's me. It's, I'm, still Jesus, I'm still the same one. I still love you. You know, I think today we need to understand that the one who loves us is, in fact, 
our Creator. He is the eternal God. And the act of redemption was not just a preference for some throughout history, but the act of an almighty, all-powerful, all-holy God who loves everybody on earth so much that He is willing to die for them. He is willing to actually give His own life and shed His blood. The Bible in the book of Acts said, God shed His blood. Well, we know it was Jesus. What more definition do we need that Jesus is in fact God? You can't get a better definition than that. And, and here we have Jesus Christ revealing Himself. And you know, the disciples had the problem of understanding who Jesus was. Uh, we all have this problem. It affects our life. Uh, your consistency as a Christian, if you're a Christian, or your actual coming to Jesus Christ for salvation, if you're not, depends on your appreciation of who Jesus Christ really is. Because like I said a minute ago, it's not a matter of preference. This is a matter of truth or error. I mean, it's either true or it's not. Good prophets don't tell big lies. And he said, I am the Son of the living God. He said, I am the Messiah. John the Baptist points to Jesus Christ as he starts his public ministry right at the very beginning and says, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Hey, he was identified as the Redeemer. He was identified as the Redeemer. Now, later on, the apostles, as they were being selected by Jesus, said, we have found, we have found the Messiah. So he was identified as the Messiah. Then later on he said, we have found that one, that prophet of whom Moses in the scriptures spoke of. And that refers to the great I Am, the Jehovah God that Moses was talking to and identifies him as being that same Jesus Christ. You see, they knew who he was at the beginning of his ministry and they identified him as such, but then something very interesting happens. They're in a boat in a storm and, as, and you know the story, most of you, the, the storm comes up and the, the disciples are all shook up and, uh, and, and they, they're nervous and they say, Lord, the Lord is sleeping in the middle of the storm. And, and they wake him up. Peter wakes him up and says, Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? Don't you care that this boat's sinking? And so the, uh, the Lord gets up. He rebukes his disciple for their lack of belief and trust in him and his ability to control things. And he gets up and he calms the wind and the sea. And his disciples then say, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the seas obey him? Hey, this is the Creator speaking. This is the Creator talking. This is Jesus. They knew who He was, but they did not understand what it meant when they said Jesus Christ. They didn't understand who they were really dealing with. They could give Him a name, but they didn't really, in their own hearts and their own experience, understand what that meant. That's why those miracles take place. And Jesus did this miracle in Cana of Galilee, the Bible says, his very first miracle. And, it, and you remember the story, turn the water into wine. And, and then the Bible says, and his disciples believed on him. See, well, wait a minute, I thought they already believed on him. Sure, they identified him, they believed who he was, but they didn't really understand everything that involved. And so today, for you as a Christian, do you really understand and appreciate everything that's involved? when you say, the Lord Jesus Christ. You understand that this is eternal God you're talking to. This is the eternal God you're talking about. And if you want to know this God personally, even if you call yourself a Christian and you're not sure of your salvation, then, in fact, you probably have not been born again. You've probably not been regenerated by the Holy Spirit. And that was another problem. The Apostle Paul came upon a bunch of disciples and he asked them a question. He said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? Well, they didn't even know what the Holy Spirit was. They didn't have a clue. And so Paul knew they had not really experienced the regeneration necessary for a true salvation experience. Now, maybe you're in that position today. And if you are in that position today, I just want to encourage you to make that decision and understand that it's heaven or hell, that it's repent or perish, that it's standing totally justified before an almighty God, thanks to the blood of Jesus Christ that you have personally received into your life, or it's judgment because you played around and you accepted tradition 
rather than the Word of God in your life, or man's philosophy, or New Age, or some other religion. This is the truth, accept it today. Let me encourage you to do so right now. And I'll back that up by saying amen. <clears throat> to fall down at his feet and to say, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Because maybe you struggle with believing. And I encourage you to say, I'm going to, I'm going to come to God just as I am and I'm going to listen to what this good book says. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and will open the door, I will come into him the promise of Jesus to anyone who's willing to let him come in and to grow in that faith and that reverence and that respect. You could bow your head right now and you don't have to bow your head. You may want to get down on your hands and knees because maybe that's the way you feel you need to and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I do believe. I will believe. Father in heaven, I thank you of the picture we have of Jesus and the revelation and that this uncovering of him is awesome. And may we respond like John and may we be filled with faith and may you change our lives and help us to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our guests in the telecast today have been missionary Bill Hansen, who is presently in Maison Lafitte, France, establishing a local congregation of believers, and also Williams Flores, who is a member of Bill's previous church that he established in Lima, Peru, a little village called Vista Alegre, a suburb of Lima, Peru, and uh, their pastor now is Percy Castro, and uh, what a privilege it is not only for them to have a church but a school and this product of that school and other schools in the states now. It's been a joy to come into your home. We hope to see you again next week. Join us at the same time. Until then, goodbye and God bless you. You've been listening to program number 1841. If you have any comments or inquiries regarding this telecast, please address them to Miracles, Post Office Box 128, Mankato, Minnesota, 56002, and refer to program number 1841. I Believe in Miracles was produced by Grace Baptist Church in Mankato.